Nothing like the smell of turpentine, right? The smell of victory. Oh. All right, let's see if we can get through this. You okay? Do you hear me? Uh, actually, I can. Okay, I'll try to speak louder, Paco. <laughs> All right, good morning. Um, as you just heard at the uh, press briefing that preceded us, today is World Water Day. This morning, the Secretary General spoke at the high-level event to launch the International Decade for Action called Water for Sustainable Development. He said that the growing water crisis should be much higher on the world's radar and stressed that safe water and sanitation are key to pro poverty reduction, economic growth, and healthy ecosystems. He added that the water has historically proven to be a catalyst for cooperation, not conflict, but he warned that without effective management of our water resources, we risk intensifying disputes between communities and sectors and even increasing tensions among nations. His remarks are available online. And I have a water-related update from UNICEF. Colleagues who, in partnership with the global entertainer Beyonce, have been working to provide safe water to women and children in Burundi. So far, they have built 35 wells. And thanks to a new partnership with Gucci and Chime for Change, uh, 80 more will be built this year, benefiting 120,000 women, girls, and families. More information on UNICEF's website. The Deputy Secretary General is in Liberia today, and in her meetings with President George Weah, she underlined her commitment of the United Nations to support his administration to achieve meaningful progress in addressing sustaining peace and advancing sustainable development. She also attended an event hosted by President Weah to celebrate the completion of the mandate of the UN mission in Liberia, UNMIL. Speaking to the press afterwards, she said that the UN mission is yet another successful peacekeeping mission in West Africa. It was deployed in 2003 to a failed state with state institutions in ruin, a non-existent economy, and a disintegrated national police and army. Since then, the state has been rebuilt, with more than 100,000 former combatants participated in disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration programs. Justice and security institutions were restored. She said that today, Liberians enjoy peace, and UNMIL leaves behind a country that has great potential to achieve lasting stability, democracy, and prosperity. Ms. Mohammed is now uh, said it's now up to the government, with the full support of the UN and its partners, to continue to address poverty, youth unemployment, illiteracy, lack of basic infrastructure. Sustaining international communities' investment in Liberia will require continued support from donors and partners. The peacekeeping mission is leaving, but a strong UN country team will remain in Liberia to focus on development and improving the lives of the Liberian people. This morning, the Deputy Secretary General uh, also briefed the Security Council by video uh, conference, obviously, on the situation in Lake Chad. She said that considerable progress has been accomplished in the fight against Boko Haram in the Lake Chad Basin. It is now crucial to stabilize the areas that have been reclaimed and seize opportunities <coughs> to promote development, she added. Ms. Mohammed warned that violations of human rights continue to fuel insecurity in the Lake Chad Basin. Investments in strengthening community justice mechanisms will be essential. She added it is also critical for counterterrorism <coughs> activities to integrate human rights and gender dimension. Turning to the humanitarian situation, she said that 10.7 million people need life-saving assistance in the region. The Deputy uh, Secretary General called on member states to ensure that $1.6 billion humanitarian appeal is funded. Finally, she said she, we should recognize that security measures and military operations have proven their limits. There will be no sustaining peace without sustainable development, and development gains will always be at risk without lasting peace. Her remarks are available. And staying in Africa, our colleagues at the UN mission in Mali today strongly condemned <coughs> an attack against their camp in Kidal that took place early this morning. Preliminary reports indicate that some members of the international forces will be injured in the attack. No UN peacekeepers were wounded. The attack occurred as the special representative of the Secretary General, Mohamed Saleh Anadif, was accompanying a visit of the Malian Prime Minister, uh, Boubier Maiga, and members of his government to the Kidal region. Mr. Anadif condemned the attack at a time of a positive development in Mali, illustrated by the Prime Minister's visit, which he said is a strong signal for peace and reconciliation in the country and an important step towards the return of the state across the territory of Mali. <coughs> and 
Last note on um, Africa, in a statement we issued last night, the Secretary General congratulated African leaders for signing the African tr free trade, uh, African continental free trade area to create one of the world's largest trading blocks with over 50 countries. He called on an, an important step towards achieving the sustainable development goals and delivering uh, on the African agenda for peace and prosperity. Turning to Syria, our humanitarian colleagues tell us that an estimated 167,000 people have been displayed by hostil displaced by hostilities in Syria's Afrin district, with the majority going to Tal Rifat, while others going to Nubul, Zara, and other nearby areas. Access to Aleppo city for internally displaced people is currently restricted. This is a particular concern for medical cases, as there is an urgent need for medical evacuations to specialized hospitals in Aleppo city for severely sick people. Four deaths due to lack of proper health care have also, also been reported. The United Nations recalls the party's duty to evacuate and care for the wounded and sick and calls for the parties to immediately facilitate medical evacuation of the wounded and sick to treat, treat to, excuse me, to seek treatment in Aleppo city. More generally, the UN calls on freedom of movements for all internally displaced people. Meanwhile, in recent days, some 5,000 ready-to-eat ra ra rations, excuse me, Meanwhile, in recent days, some 5,000 ready-to-eat rations and 1,000 bundles of bread have been delivered daily to people in need in Zara and Nubul, and 2,500 ready-to-eat rations have been uh, delivered to people in need in Tel Rafat. Medical supplies, mobile clinics, and reproductive health services have also been provided uh, to Tel Rafat, Zara, and Nubul. A statement was issued, as you saw yesterday, from the Secretary General saying that he is alarmed by the persistent allegations of the use of chemical weapons in Syria. The use of such weapons under any circumstance is unjustifiable and abhorrent. Equally unjustifiable is the lack of response to such use if and when it occurs. Impunity cannot prevail with respect to serious crimes. The Secretary General reiterates his call for the Security Council to demonstrate unity and resolve on this matter. And ahead of tomorrow's World Meteorological Day, the World Meteorological Organization released its State of Climate 2017 report, which found that weather and climate-related events cost countries around $230 billion, making it the costliest year on record. According to the report, the North Atlantic hurricane season was the costliest ever for the United States and eradicated decades of development gains in small islands in the Caribbean, such as Dominica, major monsoon floods in the Indian subcontinent, and continuing severe droughts in parts of East Africa also contributed to 2017 being the most expensive year on the record for severe weather and climate events. The full report is on WMO's page. And a new hunger report out today sounds the alarm regarding surging levels of acute hunger. Some 124 million people in 51 countries were affected by acute food insecurity in 2017, 11 million more than in the year before. That's according to the latest edition of the Global Report on Food Crises. The report defines acute food insecurity as hunger so severe that it poses an immediate threat to livelihood or lives. The increase is largely attributable to new, and new or intensified conflicts and insecurity in Myanmar, northeast Nigeria, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, South Sudan, and Yemen. Prolonged droughts, continuing conditions are also resulting in consecutive poor harvests in countries already facing high levels of food insecurity, malnutrition in eastern and southern Africa. Produced each year by a group of inter international humanitarian partners, the report was presented by the European Union, the Food and Agricultural Organization, and the World Food Program at a briefing in Rome. And uh, lastly, I was asked yesterday about the ports, the status of the ports in Yemen. And I can tell you that Yemen's main ports, including Hodeida and Salif, have been remained open since the coalition ceased import restrictions last, late last year. However, we need these ports to remain open for humanitarian and commercial cargo without restriction. We are concerned that commercial shipping companies appear to be calling on these ports less frequently due to concerns over the port's future status and experience with long delays and other obstacles that increase the cost of doing business. Bureaucratic impediments, including multiple inspections of vessels, arbitrary restrictions on imports, and long delays in allowing vessels to enter port must stop. Even before the crisis, Yemen imported about 90% of its staple food. Maintaining the flow of these imports is absolutely essential. 
Airports have remained open for the UN and other relief agency humanitarian flights since late November 2017. However, Sana Airport has been closed to commercial traffic since August of 2016, which has prevented thousands of people from traveling abroad to seek medical care. We are calling on Sana Airport to reopen to commercial flights and at the very least for humanitarian cases. Voila, Madame Landry. Stefan, concerning the Secretary General's statement yesterday on chemical weapons mm -hmm. in Syria, um, is he planning uh, to be active in uh, trying to bridge the gap at the Security Council? Because clearly there's been a stalemate for months over the issue of accountability. I think this is a, a subject of, of discussion in a number of his uh, of conversations he has at, uh, at at various levels. It's clear that we do with the, the, the unity and the resolve of the Security Council on this issue is is needed. Uh, accountability needs to be had uh, when chemical weapons are used. Mr. Lee. First, I guess on another readout, and, it was, and thanks at least for providing some readout of the meeting uh, with uh, Serbia's president, there's been more reporting there about basically that, that um, after a series of meetings with, with uh, European and, and, and Western powers, that, that the discussion involved Kosovo and that he basically said uh, that it's impossible at this time for them to recognize Kosovo. And I just wondered, you said discussed various topics in the Western Balkans, even if this was the, can you say a little bit more on that? And how, how does the Secretary General convey, you know, heartfelt right or wrong positions expressed to him in those meetings to the Security Council and others? What's the, does it end there? Where, where does it go? Well, the Secretary, you know, their, their Secretary General reports to the Security Council uh, on the work of the mission on a regular basis uh, on UNMIC, as he's mandated uh, to do. And uh, I think by, <coughs> by any uh, geographical definition, uh, Kosovo is in the Western Balkans. Sure. So it's just a very diplomatic readout. That's what we do here. It's uh, our exactly. business. Uh, yes. Kind of, kind of op op exactly. opaque. But I wanted to also ask about this at, at uh, 10.30 at night and then again at 3 in the morning, according to staff. Um, uh, Marta Helena Lopez, who did do, do a briefing here from OHRM, sent <coughs> various messages about possible strikes by UN staff, saying that <coughs> salary can be withheld, saying without prejudice to whether it's a violation right. of other things. And I guess, I w one, some people were struck by the timing of it. What, what was the, the... Well, it's, it's, uh, if it's 3 o'clock in the morning somewhere okay. in New York, it's 9 a.m. someplace gotcha. else. So, uh, or or 3 o'clock in the afternoon. We're a global organization with staff all over the world, so frankly, the fact that we're sent at 3 o'clock in the morning uh, should be seen as an understanding that we have a global, a global force. This, th the message was really to help bring clarity uh, to what questions staff members may, may have, uh, and that's all well, it was. It's about, it's about bringing clarity. But when you say without prejudice to, it leaves that question open, whether in fact the, the management here is going to end up saying that, this, that going on strike beyond just a docking of pay may violate rules. That's the it's whole purpose a, of saying no, without There's prejudice. no provision in the staff regulations and rules explicitly addressing the right to strike. Without prejudice to the question of whether UN staff members have the right to strike, Certain provisions of staff regulations and rules address the consequences of a staff member participating in a uh, work stoppage. Obviously, an unexcused absence could lead to uh, a docking of, uh, of pay, which in itself, uh, the withholding salary, is not a disciplinary measure. And we, just the last one on this is when, when, when the Deputy Secretary General stopped in Geneva, can you say that she did meet with staff unions and do you view this as uh, a successful... That's a good question. I, I, I have to check on that meeting. Okay. okay. Ms. Letterer, and then I will escape this chemical. Uh, go ahead. Um, just a quick question on World um, Water Day. There mm -hmm. seems to be some controversy about whether um, water should be, the right to water should be mm -hmm. a human right. Does the Secretary General have a position? Uh, I, I'm not going to delve into the, uh, the legality of it. Uh, it is clear that water is essential to life. Uh, we have often uh, criticized and condemned uh, the use of water as a weapon of war. We've seen uh, in various conflicts at different times, uh, notably in, uh, in Syria, where uh, water plants and water sources were targeted 
uh, as a means of pressure on civilian population. Um, without water, there is no life. Mr. Lee, you get a question, then Ms. Landry, you get a question, then I will escape. Okay. Uh, I wanted to ask you, since, since uh, I, I'd asked you about the, the new South Africa, uh, DRC allegations of sexual, and, and so as, as I'm sure you've seen, based on your answer to that question, the, the South African National Defense Force has fired, fired back, li only with words, um, <laughs> saying that, that uh, it's disturbing and disconcerting that they're being, it's said that they're not cooperating with the UN in such matters when the truth is the opposite. So I just wanted to ask you, not, are you satisfied with their cooperation? Have they I, I have no, I will try to get an update. I have no update since, uh, concerning their cooperation since we briefed you last, but I will, uh, I will get you something. Okay, Ms. Landry. Madame. On Western Sahara, uh, we got zero information from uh, Horst Kohler yesterday after the consultations. So I know that he met with the Secretary General. Is the Secretary General hopeful that something can happen I think, uh, this year I, I would, on I Western Sahara? I would ask Sahara? you to, for a little bit more patience. The Secretary General's uh, annual report on Western Sahara. Uh, should be out, I think, going to the council in a, in a week or, or so. Uh, I don't have the exact date. Uh, and I think that will reveal uh, the Secretary General's position um, and uh, his, uh, his look forward. Thank you. I'll leave you in Brendan's hand.